Welcome back to Understanding Economics and welcome back to the dramatic saga of the boom-bust cycle. In our last episode, the policies of John Maynard Keynes had pretty much convinced the governments of capitalist economies that the boom-bust cycle was something we had to live with, but fiscal and monetary policies could ease the brunt of it and return depressions into recessions. However, we still hadn't come up with any believable theory for the basic causes of boom-bust cycles. They just seem to keep coming. Now, the Keynesian remedy for a slowdown was to inject money into the economy. But what this did effectively was to place the economy on a seesaw between recession and inflation. Eventually, the deficit spending and easy credit would have to be stopped to keep too much money from coming into the economy, causing a rise in prices, inflation. The whole subject of money and banking is fraught with mystery and controversy, and we'll need to return to it in some detail later on. For now, it's important to realize that the government's fiscal and monetary policies can only influence the supply of money. It cannot control it. This is because the overall supply of money is affected by the actions of thousands of private banks. When people borrow money from the banks, for example, when you get a home equity loan, the amount of money you borrow is deposited into your checking account, and the overall supply of spendable money in the economy goes up by that amount. That's why it's possible for a condition of runaway inflation to emerge, because the amount of money in circulation depends on a multiplicity of decisions made by individual lenders and borrowers. Now, the Keynesian response to high inflation is the reverse of its prescription for recession. Higher taxes and higher interest rates to rein in the supply of, of money. These are not things that make life easier for most people. It leaves them with less money to spend and makes borrowing harder. The cure for inflation, in other words, is to turn up the forces that push the economy toward recession and vice versa. This creates a situation in which recession and inflation are always in opposition. And after many years of applying Keynesian policies, we found out that it seemed impossible to eliminate one without getting a too painful dose of the other. The economy found itself in the condition of stagflation, stagnant economic growth despite ever rising prices. It seemed impossible to get rid of unemployment without creating too much inflation. The reasons for this were complex, and we'll explore them in our next lesson. In the meantime, though, the concept of the Nehru, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, one of those ponderous economic acronyms that we're saddled with, became a standard part of the economic lexicon. Economic policymakers no longer hope to eliminate unemployment, but rather to bring it down to the lowest rate at which there would not be an unacceptable rise in inflation. This, in a classic exercise of doublespeak, is the Nehru. It became known as the point of full employment. Full employment was no longer defined as every willing, able worker working at a job, but rather a certain level of employment, four, five, six percent, it tends to go up, at which we wouldn't have too much inflation. Move forward again to the, around the turn of the 21st century. Society was poised for yet another huge boom. And a series of policy decisions were made that seemed, in hindsight, to bring a return of the Roaring Twenties kind of economic volatility. A new wave of technological innovation, this time in communication and information technology, unleashed a wave of economic growth. Investors wanted to get on the bandwagon, so there was pressure to ease restrictions on investment banking. In 1999, the Glass-Steagall line between deposit and investment banking was repealed, and new speculative bubbles began forming. First, we had the dot-com bubble of 1997 to 2000, after which some $5 trillion of asset value was lost in the stock markets. But that was a minor blip compared to the huge real estate bubble of the 2000s. It was fueled by low taxes, persistently low interest rates, subprime mortgages, and unregulated, too-big-to-fail banks, and it led to an economic crisis that threatened to be as deep as the Great Depression. We can see some common threads in these stories of economic woe. In all of the big ones, a surge of increased productivity created huge new opportunities. 
In 1837, it was a boom in cotton exports and lots of new land created by Jackson's forced removal of Native Americans in the Southeast. In 1873, it was the economic boom made possible by railroads. In 1929, there was a big bloom of American industry, cars, farm equipment, and all manner of manufactured goods. In the early 2000s, it was the revolutionary economic impact of the internet, computers, and robotics. A common element in all of these booms was that each one touched off a binge of land speculation. We said before that Henry George claimed to have identified land speculation as the root cause of economic depressions. This makes sense. As production grows, demand for land increases, yet no more land is available. Eventually, the price of land gets too high for producers to afford, and production begins to stop. Seems simple enough. And yet, as we noted before, there was a bit of a hiccup in George's explanation. His theory held that the economic slowdown would start when land values were too high for labor and capital to afford. Therefore, employment and production would fall while land values were at their peak. George believed that land values would only fall after the recession had gone on so long that a lot of landowners started really needing the money and they would accept lower rents and prices. The problem is that economic downturns don't follow that sequence. What actually happens is that land values fall before production starts declining. Now why in the world would that happen? Let's examine this. If everyone bought land by saving up their money until they had the asking price in cash, then Henry George's theory of depressions would make perfect sense. As production increased, it would just be that much harder to save up the price of land. Eventually, more and more people wouldn't be able to afford it. But that's not the way land is bought. Real estate, either for housing or commercial use, is a big purchase that people very seldom make in cash. Real estate is almost always bought with borrowed money. Loans require collateral, an asset that can be pledged to the lender if the borrower fails to pay. In most cases, the collateral for real estate loans is the real estate that is being bought. In other words, if the, if the borrower can't pay, the, the lender seizes the real estate itself. That's the collateral. This process has profound economic effects. Okay, this is a lot to keep in mind at once, so let's reiterate. We've just observed that land prices have three parts. Land's rental income, the rate of interest, and a speculative premium based on expected increases in land value. Land is almost always purchased with borrowed money, and the collateral for real estate loans is most often the real estate that the borrowed money is buying. Aha! This creates a self-reinforcing speculative bubble. Land values are expected to rise. The collateral for the money people borrow to buy the land is based on the value of land, which includes a speculative premium. If the value of the collateral increases, more money can be borrowed. And if more borrowed money is available for buying land, the demand for land goes up, which tends to increase its price, which tends to increase its collateral value. You see how the vicious cycle is created there. But, of course, it can't go up forever. We ought to know. In the run-up to the Great Crash of 2008, society tried its very hardest to keep it going up forever. Local banks have reached their limit of new mortgage loans. No problem. Big banks will take them off your hands for cash. Or the quasi-governmental organizations like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which acted like investment banks in this case. Banks will then bundle all these mortgage loans, shady ones and sound ones, all together into mortgage-backed securities. This would allow banks to keep right on loaning. But there are only so many credit-worthy borrowers? Not a problem. We'll start extending credit to riskier borrowers and subprime mortgages. The financial structure gets more rickety. Eventually, the camel's back is so loaded that it can't take even one more piece of straw. What happens then is that land values plummet. This is because the collateral for new real estate loans is based on values that are expected to keep increasing. As soon as they stop increasing, they have nothing else to do but fall. And in 1929 or 2008 or any of the other major bust years, they fall rapidly. When they do, a lot of people suddenly default on their mortgage loans. Banks lose assets. This makes new credit hard to get which makes businesses harder to run because businesses of all kinds depend on lines of credit for all kinds of day-to-day -day operations. Demand falls, 
workers get laid off, the recession is underway. Here then we have an explanation for the root cause of the boom-bust cycle that accords with all the observed facts. The sequence of events has much to do with banking and credit, in particular the practice of accepting land as collateral, which is a bad policy all around, yet is a standard practice in every advanced economy. This practice supercharges all of the damaging economic effects of land speculation. We noted before that Henry George's theory didn't do well at predicting depressions to come. In fact, Henry George himself failed to predict the depression that came in 1893, during the height of his fame. Fortunately, though, this modified theory has done somewhat better. Using it, two Georgist economists, Fred Harrison and Fred Foldberry, working separately, accurately predicted the 2008 crash some 10 years in advance. Indeed, Georgists have described a land and credit-based boom-bust cycle occurring at 18-year intervals on the average over the last two centuries. Next time, we're going to review what we've seen so far about the boom-bust cycle using some economic charts and graphs to depict these phenomena. Thanks for watching, everybody. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science with excellent video work by Oladzu Murtakuchu. In our next session, we apply macroeconomic charts to see if they can help us understand the intricacies of the boom-bust cycle.